I will lift up my eyes to the hill from which comes my, my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keep, keeps you will not will not a slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall, shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your, your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall, shall not strike you by day, nor the moon but by night. The Lord shall preserve all you from all your evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall be preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and for end, for even for it, evermore. I have read read, read, read Psalm 1, 1, 121 in its entirety. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Oh, help King Jesus.
because you are God, you are worthy of all praise, honor, glory, and love. And we exalt your name today, we magnify your name. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask a special blessing on this worship service today, dear God. We pray, dear God, that whatever we said here today will be pleasing to your ears. These are not prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. Amen. 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 And amen. This afternoon, there will be no power hour because tomorrow night we have our watch night service. Watch night service starts at 10.30 and goes until 12 midnight, the new year. And so we are asking that you come out and be blessed. Start out the new year in church, and maybe there's a prophecy for you. Maybe, maybe there is a prophecy for you that you may engage in a share on a watch night. So spread the word that we have watch night service 10.30 tomorrow night. Amen. Amen. On Wednesday, uh, these are the arrangements for Deacon Bazzi. The viewing and wake will be 12 o'clock here at the church, and that will be followed at 1 o'clock with a funeral service here at the church. So those are the arrangements for Deacon Bazzi Wednesday wake at 12, 1 o'clock is the funeral. And we ask 
ask in as usual that the choir, um, those who are able to make it, choir members or, or members of the church, you know what we do, come and help out with the singing. And as usual, um, all of our um, ministries that usually participate in some way or the other, when we have funerals, we are asking um, that you um, do the very best you can. You know that, um, that uh, you know what you normally do. Just keep praying for one another. And of course the family of Deacon Babsy and for all of us. Deacon Babsy was a deacon of course, or a deacon of ministry, a greeter at 8 o'clock. Supplies us with um, the goodies every Sunday for the breakfast ministry. And um, was instrumental in getting the steel band ministry started. And he worked for the senior program here at the church and did an excellent job as a driver for the senior nutrition program. Amen. If you know Bible class or midweek service on Thursday, once again, it's because we are urging you to come to the watch night service. Amen. I have a few other things to share with you all. Coming up in the month of January. Amen. We uh, made some new uh, additions to our um, after school and before school program. We are having a drop in for teen, uh, for, for high school students. We're having a drop-in program where they come whenever they want to come down <coughs> on the supervision and do whatever they, you know, is wholesome to do or is break dancing or whatever they want to do. Uh, an effort to keep them off the street and being a latchkey teenager is a, can be a very dangerous thing. There are the, the funds all over the country for team programs have dried up, slashed. Um, and so we need to provide a, a very wholesome place for the kids to come, the teenagers to come, and to do their thing on the supervision. So that's an addition, and that's an additional part of the um, after school program that we are implementing. <coughs> Along with that, we're encouraging more clubs, and um, I have volunteered and I have helped. I have. People are going to help me um, with a chess club. <coughs> um, Vincent Thomas is uh, he's going to help me. And what Vincent has proposed, uh, you know, he, I don't know, we want to do something else, I think. Because uh, we want to help the youngsters in the after school program with chess. As you know, chess has really been doing a wonderful thing in many of the minority communities. 
Uh, there are several young people in Brooklyn who are masters. Young, young, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, masters, chess masters, high school kids. And that's something exceptional, exceptional. So we want to encourage our kids here. Uh, I know you play chess. Um, so uh, Deacon Green, Deacon Green is going to. So now Vincent, as um, he's putting that, yeah, well, he, he, he's going to, he's going to, he's my right hand man there. And, uh, but he has put a kind of addition to it where adults, you know, some of us adults, we're going to be playing chess with each other in the clouds. <laughs> oh, yeah, in the internet, world, worldwide. Yeah. So if you play chess and you want to join the adult chess group, uh, no, I'm not kind of expanding this, <laughs> Winston, I kind of make it. <laughs> yeah, Winston says he's, he loves for somebody to beat him. <laughs> you want to explain them a little bit? You, what do you think, Winston? You think you should explain them a little bit about this program? Oh, it's called it's your turn dot com. Chess uh, teams play online. I play with people from all over the world. Um, if you want to join? Just get past your email and I'll send you a name and you can sign up. And we'll be playing chess. I look forward to someone beating me. It's your turn dot com. You can also go online yourself and uh, sign up yourself. And Yesterday, I'm Vincent uh, from Corn, and anybody can look up the person's name, where they're from, and if you see them, you can request the same thing. It's chess, checkers, backgammon, battle shit. I play all games, bro. Calendar. I 
uh, I, I, I know the guys, uh, you know, I'm going to ask the guys. Originally we had said, you know, father, daughter, you know, we were trying to think what we could do, but we said just everybody. So you can bring the whole family. Amen. Fly up? Yeah, we are fly up. Yeah, we are fly up. I guess some more made up. Yeah. We got lots of flowers we can pass on the community. Good, good idea, uh, Gerald. Yeah, good idea. Thank you so much. On January the 21st is the Martin Luther King breakfast, 8 o'clock, at the Windwatch Hotel. That is the program of the First Baptist Church of Riverhead that we always support. And um, today is just about the last day or so that I can, you know, put this out because we have to send the money to Riverhead. They won't give. They don't give out tickets unless they get the money. And so, if if you want to go, just see me. Amen. Now uh, in February we have the marriage retreat coming up. <laughs> and that's, that is that that is sponsored by the Faith Baptist Church. And of course, um for the Martin and Deacon Martin they they um they um supervise this it's a ministry that they supervise. And there is flyers in the bulletin, uh, flyers on the internet. Um, Brother Martin, do you have anything to say? And last week you really did. Uh, I, I didn't say it all.
have Jason Ash, who is a seminary student. Now he's studying to be a minister. I might make him wince a little bit, but I'm sure he, he hears it all the time. Professional degree. <laughs> They say they, they say that down there. What is this? They, that's, they still call it that, right? Your professional degree in ministry. Amen. Should be happy to have him here. Anybody else? God, whoever we are today, wherever we are from, and some of us are in other places visiting families and other relatives, and all of our internet viewers, all the people I know that today right off the bat, some people from Florida, from Atlanta, China. Wherever, Lord, that we may just lift up right now our hands to you. We pray, God, that you would touch us and bind us, secure us, in your grace and give us your peace. Heal those who need to be healed. Deliver those who need to be delivered. Put a smile on somebody's lips and wipe the frown of the forehead. Lighten up their countenance from the forehead to their chin and stimulate them and stir up in them your spirit from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Bless your people even now as we anticipate new blessings, new opportunities in this coming year. God, we have to thank you for our journey thus far. And we thank you yet for another day and another opportunity to honor you and to praise you and to lift you up. And some of us just ought to be determined to give you more praise in this coming year and to thank you more forcefully and to worship you from the bottom and the depth of our soul. Some of us just need to break out and just let it go and have you take your rightful place in our lives. In fact, right now we need a break. We need a praise break.
test for your girlfriend? Dear God, we ask a special blessing in the offering, the tithes and the offering that we are about to receive. We pray that we be used to the building if you can. These are not the prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son. Amen. Amen.
The song that I am going to retire on <laughs> is called Pour Out My Heart. It's the old song, oh, 1994. And I'm not quite sure that I'm pronouncing his name correctly. It's Greg Rousseau. <coughs> it, it sounds French. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Now, the song as it was written, I cannot dance to. I don't dance country and western. But the Brazilian remade the song. And they're so passionate that it had my name on it. And the name of the directors that I'm teaching. They, both of them will graduate in June, I think. Um, Shirley Hart was practicing with us, and she's been with me the longest for many, many years. But she came to rehearsal yesterday. She's not well, and she could not make it, so she's very, very sorry. Unless she's sleeping in her bed, she will be here. Elaine and I will be dancing also with her in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Elaine will be my dance director. We have the flag ministry, whose the director is Valerie. Everybody knows him? Yeah, Valerie, right? You see him all the time. Yeah. The director for the youth ministry is Azaria and Diamond. Azaria is the director, Diamond is the co director. She may be very shy about it, but that's what she is. Okay? They work very well together. Then you have the youth ministry, male. Can you stand so we can see who you are? That's all you So every group has their director. So I can relax, and that's when I feel like it. Amen? Now the song is in Brazilian language. It's a lot more passionate. Word for word, it doesn't say exactly the same thing, but means the same thing. So, I will um, ask Elaine to read one portion of it, and I will read the rest. And it's basically say the same thing. When you hear me, the song say, Mi derrama, it says a lot, it means I'm poured out. Okay? So, if that's all you can concentrate on, then fine. I'm poured out. Dios a grande. Pour out my heart. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Pour out my heart. Here I am again. I pour out my heart. For I know that you hear and you cry. You are listening. No matter what state my heart is in, you are faithful to answer with words that are true and I hope that is real. As I feel your touch, you bring freedom to all that's within me. In the safety of this place, I am longing to pour out my heart to say that I love you. Pour out my heart to say that I need you. Pour out my heart to say that I'm thankful. Pour out my heart to say that you're wonderful. God bless us as we dance before the
The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, the third chapter, reading verses 16 to 25. The book of Genesis, the fourth chapter, reading verses 16 to 25.
standing in the need of prayer this morning? Yes. Pray for everybody else, but you got to pray for yourself too. Yes. Hallelujah. You can sing with us on this one too if you want. So just pray with us now. We're, we're just blessing God this morning. Amen. We just thank God for this privilege to be here today.
now to the so that you and your word may increase their God. I pray that God that whatever said there, God, be a blessing will be pleasing to your ears. These are not a praise, but they ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. 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 Title of today's sermon is That's Not Fair. The need for fairness is among the deepest needs of, human, of the human soul. The yearning for fairness is something that seems to be implanted in us at birth and becomes vivid when we grow to the awareness of the social world beyond ourselves. From the time we are small children, we keenly sense when others have not been fair to us. Whether preferential treatment is given to others in the midst of a game, when we are unjustly blamed, for something we have not done, or when we receive less than our rightful share. This powerful desire that the world and those in, in it, this powerful desire that the world and those in it to be, need to be fair is a longing that remains with us for the rest of our lives and colors the texture of our experience every day. This, there is unfairness large and small and unfairness which is created by human beings as opposed to those acts of unfairness that befall us by nature. On the small side, we all know what it feels like to be slighted or unrecognized or uncredited by another for something we have accomplished. We know what it's like to be deceived, to be duped, to be lied to or manipulated by another person in the small everyday circumstances of life. We all know what it feels like to have our dignity called into question. Sometimes we let these things pass. Sometimes we are driven to rectify them and set the record straight. But sensitive as we are to unfairness, we almost always feel the pain of these circumstances as we physically feel the pain of the timeless pain. To speak of calamity befalling someone, there is none like that which has befallen Job. What, what can you do in this life when God himself boasts about how blameless and upright you are and yet have the audacity and God would have to excuse me for saying that, to give the devil permission to touch all that you own, then guarantees your survival to witness every bit of it. These are the words according to God, if you do not believe me. Job 1 and 8 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. There is no better testament to your life when it comes from God himself. So why would he want to interfere with all of your blessings? Sometimes God allows the devil to interfere in the lives of even the best of us. But we have the assurance of God's word in Lamentations 3 and 33 says, For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. Yet, in the space of one hour, probably even minutes, Job lost his, all his livestock, including the sheep and his servants and the camels. To tap it off in the same moment, another servant reported to him that he had just lost his sons and his daughters. It may still be possible to continue worshiping God in times of trouble. Yes, it might be possible because it's very easy to worship God. That's hard it is for some of us to do because we have, all we have to do is simply walk into the church and just simply bow down before him and we are worshiping him without opening up your mouths. But it might become increasingly harder to continue praising him. But amazingly, Job, after 
all his losses. He got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave me, the Lord giveth, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job got to be praised. <laughs> <coughs> if I lost everything, including my son and my daughters, mm -mm. it will be very hard. Yes, I may be able to worship because just being in the presence of the Lord is to worship Him. But to praise God, because we normally praise God when He's done things for us, it's not easy. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with any wrongdoing. This is scripture. We live, we live in a very, very troubled world today. And after and during the past year, we wait with uncertainty for the next year as, a, as to what it will be. After a year, even in the Middle East with so much civil uprisings, in Libya and also in Egypt, and also natural disasters throughout this country and throughout the world. And the one, the most recent one we can remember is Hurricane Sandy. How much worse can it get, we thought? We thought Sandy was the icing on the cake. Then the tragedy unfolds at Newtown. What makes that so unbearable for each and every one of us? Not that the adults are not important, but there were 20 helpless children that were run down. And we are left with the question, why? Please do not interpret what I'm saying to compare what has happened to the experience of Job as to what has happened up in Newtown, because it's not. For we are reminded by Jesus himself in Luke 13, 1 to 5, that there are some present, and this is in Jesus' time, at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices. Jesus answered and said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than the other, than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, Jesus said, but unless what? You repent, you too will perish. <coughs> or those 18 who died with the in the tower of, when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, did you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, Jesus said. But, and again he said, but unless you repent, you too will perish. When things happen in this world, whether good or bad, we must remind ourselves that we too have two choices. Either we can repent or we can allow ourselves to perish. We can choose to worship God or we can choose to blame Him. We can choose to praise Him, as hard as that may seem, or we might be forever drown ourselves in our sorrow. We may find it very hard to accept life as it happens without any warning. Because I believe if we receive prior warning to all the tragedies, all the trials and tribulations in this world, we probably might be better prepared to handle them. But God is not like that. And yes, it can seem as though life is unfair at times. We are reminded in Romans 8, 28, that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So we ask ourselves, what good can we learn from all this? What is God trying to tell us? The life of Joseph, and, and I hope many of you know the story of Joseph, the life of Joseph is full of a lot of disappointments some of which I don't think I 
I would not be able to endure myself. It appears as though that the great love that his father Jacob had for him was more of a curse than a blessing. I use the word appear because we have the benefit of knowing the final outcome of the story of Joseph. But if all of us can be honest with ourselves and admit that we, that what we have experienced, but what he experienced was very rough. Joseph was hated by his brothers. For one, he was Jacob's snitch. Yes, he was a snitch. <coughs> 17 year old snitch. No, he hates snitch. <laughs> but most importantly, what bothers his brothers was because Joseph telling them, while telling them about his dream that he had, he interpreted, they pretty much interpreted the dream to say that eventually all his brothers, now Joseph is the youngest, but all his brothers one day will what? Bow before him. And not just his brothers, because he had another dream to. Also his parents would bow down before him. His father loved him more than the others because he was born in his old age. And, he, and because of that, he made a special role for him. The life of Joseph, however, started going downhill when his brothers first threw him in a pit. A pit that was empty, there was no water inside. Then he was lifted up out of the pit and sold to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now you know the story after that. So the question is, was he better off in the pit? Or is he going to be better off going to Egypt? Sometimes we think the pit is bad. We think that's the lowest we can get. But when you live in this world, trust me, sometimes the pit is a blessing. Because there are worse things that can happen to you. And sometime in the pit, you gotta learn how to praise. Joseph was taken to the house of Potiphar. In Genesis 39, 2 to 4, it says, The Lord was the Lord was with Joseph. And you see, this is the key, because this, is, this comes up in Scripture over and over again. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of, the, of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his master's eye, and he became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted it to his care, everything he owned. Despite our situations in life, we have to believe that God is always near and that we should never stop believing and trusting in Him. Remember, life may be unfair, but God is still good. Though God may not intervene when, he, when we want Him to, He loves us dearly and wants the very best for each and every one of us. Because we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, and that the Lord is always near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. If you want to know where God is, when the trials and tribulations come upon you, when your friends have turned their backs on you, when the doctor says that you have cancer, when your child is sick and dying, I tell you this, God is the same place when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane praying on his knees. He was in the same place when Jesus was being spit upon and being beaten. The same place when Jesus was before the court, when they were telling all those lies against him. The same place when Jesus was sentenced to be crucified. And most importantly, the same place when his only begotten son, as innocent as he was, was hung on the cross. Yeah. All right, then. 
Jesus. Where was God? He was right there watching. Amen. Probably maybe crying. The story continues of Joseph. So Potiphar left, so Potiphar left in Joseph's care everything he had. So Potiphar left in Joseph's care everything he had, except his wife. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph, another curse again, was well built and handsome. That is what the scripture said. I didn't make that up. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Now sometimes we think those soap operas are rich. Trust me, they're not. <laughs> we see this every day in the soap operas, don't we? But Joseph refused. He said, with me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife, how then could I do such a wicked thing? And this, and this is what he said. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against who? God. When we sin against our neighbor, we are sinning against God. When we tell lies on our neighbor, we are telling lies on God. And though, he, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Life can be so unfair. We gotta be careful when things are going good in our lives. Mm -mm. We gotta be careful, we gotta look out because you know the devil is right there. He's watching. The devil is always trying to destroy us in this world, and not only in this world, and the next. Because if he destroys you in this world, it simply means that your life is automatically destroyed in the next. Although you're going to be living with him, which is, which is weird, because I don't know why you want so much misery living with him, but that's the devil. He constantly tries to separate us from God, who is the primary source of our strength. When things start to go badly, it's time to get close to God as possible. Remember, repent or perish. Focus on your relationship with God. Do not leave any wiggle room for the devil to get between you and God. God. However, she eventually got the best of Joseph. And eventually she brought false charges against him because she grabbed at him and grabbed the whole of the coat and while he went, the coat was left in her hand. So now she has evidence. So because of this now in the end, she felt slighted because now, let me see if I can put this nice. You gotta be careful when you reject somebody. Some people might okay, move on and say, no, there are other fish in the ocean. But sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes they try to get back at you. And that's what happened here. To get even with Joseph, she told her husband, basically that he tried to wait. And now, so now Joseph, after things was going good, now he's put into prison again. Now he's going even lower, because now he's in a dungeon, it's much lower than a pit. 
But he was put in a prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there, and this is scripture again, you see, God is always with you. I mean, it's amazing. Once you are blessed by God, once you have found favor in, eyes, in God's eye, God just never seemed to leave you alone. Amen. But while Joseph was there in the prison, yes. again, the Lord was with him. Yes. He showed him kindness yes. and granted him favor in the eyes of now in the prison. Prison war. I mean, war. How can how can you grant baby in a war? I don't get it. So the warden, and this and this doesn't make any sense. See, God doesn't make sense most of the time. Yeah, And we keep trying to understand him, but trust me, leave God alone. So the warden now put Joseph in charge of the prison. I said, I don't understand this. You're a prisoner. In a prison that you're in charge of. <laughs> if that was me, I would have commuted my own sentence. <laughs> so he was basically made responsible for all that was done there. While Joseph was in prison, however, he interpreted two dreams of the, the cupbearer and the the baker of the king of Egypt. The cupbearer in his prediction was going to be restored to his place beside the king, which was to taste his wine if somebody wants to kill him. But the, hey, that's what it was. <laughs> you taste the wine first, and you still alive, and the king drank the wine. <laughs> hey, it is a position of honor. Hey. <laughs> so, but the baker, however, based on his dream, will, was going to be executed, and that's exactly what happened on the famous birthday. But anyway, but, but Joseph said, Joseph said to the cupbearer, he said, remember me when you are free. But however, for two years, the cupbearer forgot about Joseph, but God never forgot. Amen. Right. For two years, he forgot about Joseph. See what it is now. You see, not now Kaber is silent. God is silent. When it's nice and don't you hate when it's nice and quiet? Something is gonna happen. Something big is about to happen. God's plan is now about to be revealed. So now Pharaoh kept having dreams. And these dreams were about seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. The only problem is Pharaoh's dream to him, he knows it's a dream, he knows it's water. He doesn't have to interpret it. All his interpreters could not interpret that dream. So now the cup Pharaoh now remembers. Yes, wait a minute, it was Joseph. So Joseph came and interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. And he told him about this, these seven years that's going to be plentiful, that like we're going to have enough to eat. But after that, they're going to be seven years of famine. So Pharaoh, as smart as he was, and as good as God is, <laughs> Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now remember, he was in a prison inside Egypt, in a dungeon. Now he's on top of Egypt. Yeah. Isn't it amazing where God can take us? How low? How low? And God can make it out. Yes. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. The only time they do that is when they have a child. So you know how important he was. He was pretty much a pharaoh in Egypt. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot and the second in command. And the man shouted, and the men shouted before him, Make way, thus he put him in charge of the 
whole land of Egypt. This was a man that was in the pit. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without you, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all Egypt. So here we go again, just like Potiphar. He didn't have to do anything. Now with Pharaoh, he doesn't have to do anything. God's plan for Joseph was to secure the survival of his family. <coughs> Joseph and family. Ephesians 1, 11 to 12 means in him we were chosen, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to what? The plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of whose will? God's will. In order that we, who are the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Imagine that Joseph went through all of that just for the praise of God's glory. Amen. Amen. As I said, I mean, I know I'm standing up here before you, but it's very hard for me to praise when things are going bad. I'm being honest. All that God does through and in us is ultimately to bring him glory and to praise his name. And Joseph said, to his brothers, after he pretty much went to a home, even I tell you what, he put he literally put his brothers through the ring because then they now had to literally come from Canaan to Egypt during the years of famine to beg for food. And who were they begging for food from? Same one. And that's we gotta be careful when we step on. Right. <laughs> We gotta be careful when we knock down. Because one day, as the person of God may put in charge. But Joseph said, I am your brother, the one you saw in Egypt. And now do not distress and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save the lives that God set me here. In that mm -hmm. Another point I want to make here today. I'm going to say, I don't like art. I, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and my son, they, they like their artists. Me? I just need a ruler and I draw a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> but a mosaic is the art of creating images with an assemblage of small pieces of colored glass stone or other materials. It may be a technique of decorative art, an aspect of interior decoration, or of cultural or spiritual significance, as in a cathedral. Small pieces, normally roughly quadratic, that all that means it just has four sides, of stone or glass of different colors, known as tesserae are used to create a pattern of a picture. As a supervisor, I have adopted this way of supervising. Please don't. It may not work for you. But everybody here knows that I work near the transit and I repair the subway train. So therefore my job basically is to make sure that there's safe subway trains available to make service. So what I so, so every day now I, I go to the shop and, and I, when I drive in the parking lot, the first thing I see is that if the doors are open, but they, they, they roll up doors because the cars are inside the shop. I call them the cars, that's what we call them, but they're subway cars. So we have eight tracks in the barn, in the shop. I was gonna say barn, that's what it is. <laughs> if I say barn, I mean, I mean shop. <laughs> barn is what we call it. And inside those, Inside that shop, there, there are eight tracks. And on each track, on six of the tracks, eight subway cars can fit, so that's 48 cars. However, on any given day, 
I would have an average, maybe, maybe 40 cars to work on. And you might say, well, that might seem to a little bit of cars. I tell you, those cars are not easy to work on. They take a lot of work. They take a lot of patience. They are like a marriage. <laughs> Talk a lot of work, take a lot of patience. Amen? <laughs> I'm sorry. Just had to say. So the problem is now, I see this picture when I come into the shop every morning. I see the picture, I see, I can tell you the, the shop is full. And when the shop is full, I hate it. And it's empty and I love it. So then I walk in, they give me a bar, bar, shop map with all the tracks and everything, with, with the trick, with the, all the trains and all the problems. And I have to print out all the workouts. That's what's wrong with the trains. Now I take a picture of that in the morning. And then from that picture, I decide for myself what picture I want to see at 2.30 in the afternoon. I may start with 40 cars on hold, which causes 40 cars out of service. But in the afternoon, I may only want to see maybe 10 cars out of service, because then I have to make service for the PM service. And also, on top of that, I have to fix those cars, and whatever cars go down in service, due to the air in Russia, so it's not that easy. Those two pictures, I keep in my mind all day. Once I draw the map out, I really don't need to look at it anymore because I know where everybody is, some of them have 30 employees to work, on, work with. Trust me, it, it, you can do the same thing, it's not that difficult. No, it's not because you're, you are an expert on what, whatever you decide to do, whatever job you have as well. So there's nothing special about me. One thing is that I just have two pictures. So when I give out those jobs now to each individual, remember they all are different and they all have different qualifications. Some know a lot, some know a little bit, and some don't know anything. So I have to match them with the job because I want to create it. The reason why I'm doing that is to create that image I want to see at 2.30. As, as I work throughout the day, I see how this, this image is coming together. And sometimes I'm seeing a, a piece, which is a mosaic, a piece of a mosaic now no longer fits. It's ruining the picture, the picture that I want to see. So now I have to go there and fix that. What annoys me most in the morning is when I cannot see that picture at 2.30. Because I would stay there instead of getting the jobs up by a certain time, it would take me another 10 minutes to try to work on that picture. That is my goal. The reason why I'm telling you that God created this world, He knows the beginning, He knows what the world looks like in the beginning, He knows what He wants, him to look, what he wants the world to look at in the end. What makes up that picture is all these pieces. It's like a mosaic. When you stand far away from a mosaic, that picture looks perfect. You can't tell what's wrong with it. It looks like a perfect picture. You go up close. It's not as perfect as a small piece, just like you, just like you and I. It is not perfect. But we are part of this picture. When things start going wrong with that picture that God wants to see at the end of time. It's what we call life. As stubborn as we are, and we know how we are, we get in the way of God's plan. We do not support God in His plan. We think sometimes we know better. One day, I, I really got angry with one of the guys at work that I had to tell him my secret. I said, let me tell you something. Do you know what the, the problem is? That every day when I give you a job, you mess up my picture. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, look, I have a picture at 6.30 in the morning. I have one at 2.30 in the afternoon. You always seem to be a problem making up this picture. And I thought he was going to say, I'm sorry, but what he said later was just literally profound. He said, well, Mr. F, that maybe he could do me this one favor. 
Let me see the picture. <laughs> God, what are you doing? But God is saying, I have a plan, I have a plan, I have a picture in my mind, I know what the world's going to look like. And then we're saying, but God, let me see that picture. I'm going to tell you what's wrong, what's wrong when we interfere with God's plan. Because here it is. I'm just using the first picture. I want to show you something. This is what the beginning looks like. These one, two, three, four, eight people in the front row. It's four on this side, four on that side. Perfectly balanced. But God said, I do not want in the end for, the, for the, both sides to perfectly balanced. What I would like is for Emmett to be in between Deacon Martin and um Butler. But that's the picture that God wants at the end. He wants Emmett to be in between Deacon Butler and, and Deacon Martin. However, now here's life. The easiest way for her to move from that place to get to that location is to go past Reverend Glory and past Deacon Martin. There's only one problem. Reverend Glory says she ain't moving. <laughs> but Deacon Martin says, I'm willing to move because I'm going to be here God today. And Reverend Glory says, it's okay, I'll move. So now, you have to walk around. We're stripping over Reverend Martin to get in between that large space. Then you get to Reverend Usher. Reverend Usher might fall down to get you, let you pass. So now you're hurting. Reverend Usher is hurting. And now he comes to Deacon Martin over here. Deacon Martin, I, if Reverend Glory is moving, I ain't moving either. <laughs> so now, life. All the way around. One place to another. And all that place. What is happening? Because the thing is that you can keep it up. So to pass those three deacons, you get the bad and good. But guess what? Picture is now perfect. One of the worst things we can do is share our plans with the enemy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why God is not sharing his plan with any one of us. Because we're going to go and tell the devil. <laughs> Whatever hand you've been dealt with in life, whatever life throws you, don't lose faith in God. Continue to trust in him, continue to worship him, and, and, and as hard as it might be, Amen. continue to praise him. In the past couple of weeks, we find it very hard, and I haven't finished that much. In the past couple of weeks, we find it very hard to, to even openly praise God and say, God, you've, you've, you've done so many good things, you've taken care of us, you've watched over us. But after the Newton, Incident, it was hard. It was hard for each and every one of us to even want to praise God because it did not make any sense to me. It, it really did not make any sense because they were young, we were young children who were literally gone down for no reason at all. And, and I'm not going to try to say what is God's plan. No, I'm not going to say that because I fully, I do not understand it either. It doesn't make any sense. And I'm just still trying to ask God why, but He's not answering me. He says, Well, I'm not going to let you know. Maybe one day it will be revealed to us, just like how the life of Job was revealed to us, and we were blessed by it. Just as the life of Joseph was is a blessing to us now, because now we know the story behind it. We yet have not found out the story behind the music because we really don't know why. But there is one person there, and it's not because of the color of the, or race that she that she did inspire me. Six-year-old girl Anna, and the market queen. And the reason why I was inspired by her was the 
بازه که هم در شستان and the hymn goes like this come thou almighty king help us thy name to sing and this was she sang this one year before this before the incident help us to pray it seems as though she God was sending a, a message to her help us to praise who father all glorious all victorious come and reign over us ancient of days a young 66 at that time she was five years old praying to god in a hymn to come help us praise because during that weekend i know we came into the church but we found it very very hard to praise we came to worship and worship we probably did but to praise God it was difficult. That's why we say life is not fair. Joseph, and finally Joseph, which is why I picked this, this passage, was what Joseph did, knowing that because he, his father was faithful to him. And all Joseph was supposed to do was to give them enough clothing to go back home and for them to return. He gave his brothers one piece of clothing. Now we show favoritism to banish them. I gave him five. He even gave him a whole lot of money. But what he was actually saying to them is that have you fully repented or are you going to allow yourself to perish one more time? Because he said to them, do not quarrel on the way. Don't worry about many. Don't worry about whether or not you should have sold me down to Egypt because it was God's plan. He was telling them also, don't worry about what Benjamin got compared to you because you have enough. <laughs> Part of our problems in life, we, we do. It seems as though we don't have enough. And that's why we say life is not fair. Why? Because you know when life is fair? When you're the only one living here on this earth, you have nobody to compare yourself to. <laughs> The moment there's another person, now you start comparing and say, well, oh, that person has more than me. No, no, no. You have enough. God's plan we cannot comprehend. We don't see what he sees. We are all part of this mosaic, making up a glorious picture of what life would be in the end. At times it may seem hard. At times it may seem unfair. But one thing we can be assured of is that God knows what he is doing. Let us all continue to praise God in the good times and in the bad. Amen. 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 Amen.
everybody, everybody here has time to wait until next year. I don't know. The life is not promised. Those young children that were six or seven years old. One of the best things we can do to our kids when they're that young is to Jesus. Because it only takes a moment, it only takes one person to change it all. Thank you, dear God, for it. Now may the grace of God, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the pleasure of the Holy Spirit be in the back of us this day and forevermore. Let us all sing together. Amen.